Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to another edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where I'm coming to you from the Florida Medical Cannabis Conference in Orlando, Florida. And really, really, really just it's absolutely ecstatic over the fact that we have a guest here today who, you know, this is an area that we really need to talk about. He's a nationally recognized veterinary medical professional and one of the very few veterinary phytocannabinoid, endocannabinoid psych physiology experts in the world. He serves as a chief medical officer for Can Sultans, a Florida-based cannabis cultivation and genomic innovation project that is projected to pioneer the newest wave of cannabis understanding and use on both a micro and a macro level. I'm talking about the one and only Zach Pelosov. Got so, it. Did I get that right? That's it's, it's pretty close. It's yeah, good. Yeah, but you I'm, got uh, it. Okay, I'm going to make sure we'll I got, the, got, got it right. Yep. Did you go with that? You got uh, Pelosov is... is Pelosov is... It's, it's the <laughs> accent. It's right there. You know? <laughs> I it's messed it up. It's Thank you, sir. <laughs> all right. Well, look, thanks so much for being here. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, you're a veterinarian. And with all of the changes in, you know, the hemp law and the hemp bill, veterinarians have been left out of this correct you can't really prescribe cannabis for animals can you yeah so it's you know it's no wonder right now why it's kind of difficult to find both in the pet parent community and the veterinary industry um, a, a, a synergistic communication because it is the regulations right now in the veterinary space are are extremely gray and when they're gray it's 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 hard to find a movement to move together in in which of changing that and so there's a, a small collection of veterinarians across the country now doing a great job but when you look at the the rules in which they're written right now the rules are clearly stating and according to the, the avma that we really can't do anything beyond the uh the general idea that cannabis is there so recommending prescribing endorsing advertising applying Anything of that nature is, is a really uh, scary place for a veterinarian right now. And you're not supposed to be in that space, but yep. you can educate yourself, correct? Exactly. So that's all within the veterinary client patient relationship setting. Giving out educational information. Right. So, all right, yeah. so, all right, yeah. so let's back up for a second. What brought you to even being interested at all in cannabis, period? Yeah. So absolutely. So I was actually only a couple of years back on the path of becoming a you know classically Western medicine trained specialist in the veterinary space. So I was in a neurology neurosurgery internship program that uh, I was uh, essentially going to go down that path. And at the same time though, especially in the neurology space as we see in humans, I was getting questions perpetually by pet parents every single day that they'd either seen a neighbor as pet benefit from it and or they were questioning if they should use in their own pet for a variety of conditions, whether they were structural and or if they were of a, of a different nature in you know, a metabolic state. And, and this has been in the last, only in the last couple of years, right? Since this new wave of of pseudo CBD experts has kind of come to the, to the fore, right? Right, exactly. So you know, the primary figures in the you know quote unquote pet cannabis space or pet CBD space are are not veterinarians right now, and that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just that veterinarians have a position and a role to play here, which is essentially to provide the advisory of an objective medical. Uh, um, you know, an opinion. And that's important when we're dealing with a medicine because we've seen humans above and beyond across the world benefit in so many different ways. The systems and animals are extremely close, if not- Mammals. Yeah. Exactly. All mammals, right? All mammals, yeah. Exactly. Have, have a system that's with an endocannabinoid system. Exactly. And I guess this was first discovered. And as a matter of fact, we even realized that the endocannabinoid system was identified when they discovered the first receptors, what, back in like 1988, I think, is when the first receptors were actually identified for THC, which was CB1. And we realized that the rat model had the same receptor, correct? Yep. There's decades upon decades of back-end research that um, not only through finding receptors, but also finding out the molecules that are circulating in the body of, of every animal that essentially is, you know, down to the down to the jellyfish status. Mm -hmm. They have some component of an endocannabinoid system, so that can be potentially benefited. You know, not that we're saying we're going to start gel uh, treating jellyfish as of yet, but it just goes to prove that all these animals can potentially benefit in the future. But, but see, what I, I'm, I'm kind of confused a little bit because we used animals to identify the human system, recognize that the research that we found out in animals was beneficial to humans. So why can't you just extrapolate that data backwards? <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, how stupid can we be? It is, uh, 
it's a comically uh, interesting situation, isn't it? That uh, the phase one, phase two trials to get to some of the advancements in human evolution in the cannabis space were through animal models, but yet uh, we have six, you know, quote unquote, perspective, objective studies in the veterinary space that help us right now with more to come. But it's it's a conundrum that's kind of, it is perplexing in a way. But because you say you have six objective studies in the animal space, meaning studies that were done deliberately to research the effect on an animal, but the research that was done on animals to risk, to figure out the effect on humans. <laughs> hey, what, am I cart before horse? What am I doing here? This is like, this is one of these things that just doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. And that's why, you know, I, I I like to help people understand that we've been doing research for decades, whether you're a human or an animal. The rat models, the mice models, they show a, a, an interesting variability in some different ways, especially inside the, the central nervous system. So that's important uh, to consider. We, we actually identified in the rat model that what molecule was the molecule responsible for a psychotropic effect. Exactly. So it's it's a, it's an interesting situation, hmm. but it's it's a it's a launching platform. So you know, when we are ready to move together as an industry along with the human industry, then we have something to fall back on. Now that we have evidence and research, you know, we have to move forward with it. Gotcha. Now, so as a veterinarian, you are not allowed if a patient comes to you and somebody comes and says, "Look, I heard about this." Well, I, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, my manager had a big uh, Great Dane, a big Great Dane, and uh, just a beautiful dog. And, and, and you know, they woke up one morning realizing that he needed to go to the doctor's because there was something weird going on with one of his legs. And when they took him in, they, he was identified as having had, you know, a large cancerous growth on uh, one of his legs. And, you know, I think the immediate um, prognosis and, and diagnosis, well, I can't remember what the exact type of cancer was, but... You know, the doctor basically was giving them an option of he's got to have his leg amputated. And, you know, this is a, you know, a big, that dog was close to a hundred pound Great Dane that was going to lose legs to run around with three legs. And they opted to treat him not by the doctor's recommendation at all, but had understood and heard some, some anecdotal information about the fact that other animals had kind of survived being treated with cannabis and opted to treat this big Great Dane with cannabis and a dog that was given like a life expectancy of months ended up living for years using cannabis. As a matter of fact, then the tumor shrunk. I mean, it was very clear and obvious that this cannabis had helped this dog. I, and I, I have heard anecdotal stories like this and I guess science is you know, all about, you know, validity through, you know, double blind studied research, but you know, anecdotes are anecdotes when there's maybe one or two, but when or n of ones or or n of ones when there's maybe one or two. But when you hear this 50, 60, 500, 2,000, 10,000 times, that's not an anecdote. Right. Absolutely. And you you defined why I'm here is because basically I I'm I'm right there with you and I'm hearing mm -hmm. these stories. And we have to give a voice to these anecdotal stories that are coming into us. Subjective data in a large quantity can be just as influential and moving as, you know, a double-blinded placebo-controlled study if, if it's documented and... and It's real-world real, real world research in a sense. 100%. Exactly. Right. So we have to find a way in order to be able to co communicate that into something that people are trusting as well. And and it's again, it's it's a it's something that drives me every single day to be here and in the front of a pioneering industry with all these other great figures that are doing things in, in the human space and to sure. be able to do that in the animal space. There's so much room for growth. And that's exciting because people are, are willing and ready to grow. Can you, can you at least talk about can you talk about, you know, what are some of the top reasons that you've heard people will seek out cannabis as a treatment for an animal? Can you talk about that? What other people do, not what you do, yeah. but what people do. Right. Yes, exactly. Sure. It is. It's, it, you know, it's funny, but you, ha you have to call it self-medicating. Right. You're self-medicating your, your pet parent, you know, mm -hmm. your pet parent, you're self-medicating your pets. So it's interesting. But yes, what are people using it for? They're using it for, for most of the conditions in humans. So generalized anxiety disorders and um, stress reduction, anxiolysis, and then chronic pain. Those are the, mm -hmm. the things that are used on a regular basis where especially the, the younger generation that's involved in this cannabis movement and they're very ready and willing to know that there's efficacy there 
where, where I'm looking to come in myself as well as with the pioneering veterinarians in the field as well. There's five, six, seven of them that are doing an amazing job as well. And then hopefully more as we go on is then we help to establish the safety profile, looking to look at the ancillary molecules that are added to these products that people are using across the country and the world. And that's where the veterinarian can come in, the safety aspect, the efficacy of pure cannabis-based therapies. I think subjectively we know through those anecdotes that were there, but I do hear at the same time, some people say it doesn't help. And there are some people that say it does. So what is the difference between those? Is it product to selection? Is it the different conditions? Or is it something we have to start finding? A or is it for? the same thing that we see with all pharmaceuticals, that all pharmaceuticals don't help everybody? Exactly. I mean, you know, a molecule is a molecule. A molecule isn't necessarily going to help every other person, every person out there. I mean, I, I think the FDA will approve a drug if it's only got a 30% efficacy rate. <laughs> so if it only works for three out of 10 people, a drug can get approved. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, I mean, the world we're in right now is there's uh, questions everywhere. But what, again, keeps me optimistic in this this position right now, we're trying to find where exactly, uh, you know, in the gray zones of where we can go, where where does the white the white light exist in terms of finding answers and being able to move forward? Um, that, that's the questions that can be answered if we continue to move on as an industry. Okay, so if, if we were to look at the fact that, you know, the end, we know now, and I think we have now proven the fact that all mammals have an endocannabinoid system. That endocannabinoid system, if extrapolated, would probably work the same in all animals. It works in one way in human beings, so it helps to regulate homeo cellular homeostasis. Correct. We know that, and down to the mitochondrial level. Absolutely, yeah. So if we know that, we can, can we then assume that it, I'm again, just saying from extrapolation, mm -hmm. can we assume that Assume that it does the same thing in animals that it would do in a human. Yeah, in, in the basic understanding, yes. So the ligands or the molecules that are floating around, the enzymes that are going to help break down and create those molecules, and then the receptors are going to bind to, whether they are endocannabinoid receptors and or the breadth of other receptors in our body, such as the trip receptors, the serotonin receptors, et cetera, that can be influenced by the endocannabinoid oversight. Those are all things that in general, yes, we'll communicate over to animals. However, the density and the distribution of those molecules is what kind of differs slightly, which is why we see a little bit of a different effect in humans versus animals. You, you've seen people now, I think you can, maybe you can address this now, but you, you've seen some patient or some parent pet parents mm -hmm. come in because, you know, their their puppy, you know, got into a bag and ate something they shouldn't eat. Yeah. And, you know, probably ate, you know, a gram and a half or a couple grams, three, four, five grams, and maybe even, you know, an eighth. And, yeah. um, you know, then the animal appears to be lethargic and ill what what happens then what do you how do you how do you help get a, a dog or a puppy out of an overdose <laughs> right so it's very interesting because it there's <laughs> and wait, wait i'm sorry maybe you can also think of addressing it at the same time animals are definitely affected differently by thc than humans are correct exactly so that's the other component to the the studies and research we need going forward is essentially understanding the metabolic breakdown that's different what's happening when they ingest it in between their gastrointestinal and their liver. Because they have such a short, I mean, you know, dogs have, you know, it's really funny, a lot of people, I saw a documentary recently that I, it was something I didn't even know, that, you know, when you look at the human being, the human being's digestive tract is about nine times longer than the uh, human being's height. Yeah. So, you know, if, if I'm five foot tall, I've got a, you know, I'm six foot tall, I have a, you know, what, seven or 54 <laughs> foot long, you know, <laughs> intestinal tract. Yeah. Somebody, yeah, it's right. and, and animals though, dogs, especially theirs is only about three times as long as their length. So, you know, you got a little puppy who's like, you know, under a foot long, he's only got a three foot long intestinal tract. So right. they're digesting it differently than we digest. Yeah. And then at the same time, you know, there's, there's I guess it's hard to really bring it down to one, one simple element, but at the same time, then you look at a horse, right? That has this extremely large gastrointestinal tract. However, horses are very adapted to absorbing fats effectively in their stomach. So before it has to go through that entire system, how much do we have to worry about that? Or do we really have to worry about it and think about transmucosal, sublingual, and or suppositories for these large ruminant species or these, you know, gut fermenters, we call them, compared to dogs, which again, do have this short, this short gastrointestinal tract. It's there's so many variables. But what again, what I hope people understand as an educational non client patient relationship is that the safety of cannabis by itself, we, we've seen that in terms of that, yes, there's ways in which THC can affect your body in a, in a way that's maybe a little excessive, but when it comes to CBD, there's not one study out there that shows that it can be um, significantly harmful. Now, with that said, and 
in animals were lacking longevity studies. Right now we have some short-term studies to support it, but we have a lot of evidence to say that what is more important right now is to make sure the product you are potentially considering is not included with a lot of ancillary molecules in addition to the cannabis that can adulterate and or destroy the potential benefits that you'll see while you still have to self-medicate. And explain that a little bit more, meaning like, you know, a lot of the preparation ancillary chemicals that are used to emulsify mm -hmm. the CBD right. could be harmful, deleterious to your pet, correct? They're right. different than they are in humans. Types of sugars that are used, you know, I mean, again, you never want to give a dog chocolate, period. Yeah. But, you know, there are, you know, um, uh, humans can can consume CBD with chocolate, but a dog can't. Exactly. And you're you're hundred on the track of where I think that veterinarians eventually are going to be able to impart the most influence initially is that the um, the things that are added to it. And you're right. So that. For example, here's an easy example. When you're looking for a human product, you want to look for what's the, the certificate of analysis testing for, you know, your mycotoxins, your pesticides, herbicides, and then also your heavy metals. That's some different than in animals. However, there are certain things as well, like you touched on, such as sweeteners, flavorings. Xylitol is a classic flavoring, for example, that we add. That's a not, you know, a, a non-calorie sweetener, but it is toxic to dogs. Something that has chicken or beef in it, two of the most common allergic components to dogs. The dogs have that atopic you know, allergic dermatitis all the time. If they're on hypoallergenic diet, but they're getting a product that has chicken in it, it can completely destroy their quality of life in that aspect. So you're trading off and you're not really understanding at the same time when you're thinking about it in a single entity, then what is the global zooming out picture? Mm -hmm. So that's where I think that we're going to be able to definitely move forward the quickest is, is being able to consult and advise on companies that are making pet products first before the veterinarian can recommend or prescribe. And that's what you're doing right now. I mean, you're working as a consultant to a company that's developing pet products, right? Right, exactly. So what I've, what I've started to try and do basically is become, again, an independent cannabis industry influencer and an advisor for companies that either want to start creating a product for pets and or have a product out that we can revise what they've already written, their content, their their whatever media they're creating, et cetera, the things that are going to make them antagonistic to the potential benefits that cannabis can offer to pets. In the meantime, while well, I still can't do it as a doctor. Dan, this does not, not put a crystal ball on, but but look at the environment that we're in right now. I mean, how long do you think it will be before, you know, can cannabinoids are respected in the, the veterinary community? <laughs> I, love, I would love to be able to answer that question. I really would. It would be tremendously exciting. There are certain states that have done a great job in terms of maybe heart starting to create a, um, a checkpoint. So mm -hmm. in, in California, for example, is one of the only is the only state uh, and then in Canada as well, where they've defined that veterinarians can specifically discuss cannabis with their clients and essentially their, you know, which are their pet parents about their pets. And so that's a, it sounds like a small minute advancement, but to be able to discuss in your office, in your practice is probably insanely helpful. I'm, I'm not licensed in, ca in California, but I'm licensed in many other states, but essentially to finally be able to clear some conscience for both sides and allow for some type of um, di direction to go. That's gonna be helpful. And, and I think that there's a number of floating around by 2021 that there's gonna be another advancement such as being able to potentially recommend products that are trusted and safe. Um, that's where we're leading. But again, it's a slow process when we're working with governmental and private aid entities mm -hmm. that are trying to be weary that there are things we need to answer first before we go forth and allow for you know use in, in other areas do you know about any studies that are going on right now that have any, any that give you any hope or are you excited about any studies that have been you know talked about or that you know that are in the process can you talk about something like that yeah so uh, 2018 was the year that we finally started to get some great objective studies in in veterinary medicine but as you touched on before, these are studies that occur in a research setting. So there's their normal animals and they're being given a stimulus and they're be giving a, a drug essentially. And, you know, it can't be considered a drug yet, but it is essentially a medicine that we're testing. And so, you know, at Colorado State and uh, Cornell was where we got our first two studies from. And they were on uh, seizure control and on chronic pain for arthritis respectively. However, at the same time, like we touched on before, these are not real life situations. So the doses they use in those situations may be different than what we need in the normal setting, especially if dogs are using it for multiple conditions. Like if you have a dog who has, has a seizure malady, mm -hmm. they're not using dogs that have seizures to test the product. 
Yeah, so um, there was another study that came out in 2019, actually, with dogs that were having seizures that were already on other anti-epileptics. And then they started to add cannabis-based therapeutics in as well. And so that did show some, some really positive results in terms of being able to combine with medications that are being used, such as the classics are phenobarbital and then potassium bromide is another one, et cetera. There's a couple more we use. Um, but essentially it showed in that study, which was really impressive, was that it didn't in the short term affect the, the, the amount that was circulating in the body and it didn't cause any specific adver adverse effects to occur. So we have prospective studies coming out. They're short, um, but they are a guiding light that there's a future that's very bright for us. Wow. So, I mean, I think so a, a patient or a, a pet owner right now can look to what, a couple of years. How long do you think it'll take for some of this to be extrapolated over the data that can be used to then actually dispense? Well, I guess a patient parent or a pet parent can go ahead and do so on their own right. without having to get a recommendation. But is there some place they can go and read some information so they know what they're doing? Right. So uh, number one, that's that's what 2020 is going to be for me, at least, is I'm going to start developing a platform for, again, strictly non-veterinary client patient relationship, um, health and wellness advisory and consultations. So generalized understanding of what your pet's condition, et cetera, and then how, what are the different treatments, remedies that we're on already, and then potentially through indirect measures, how we can start to understand where cannabis is, both using the objective research we have that's in a large amount in the human space and then the small amount that's coming out in veterinary medicine. But at the same time, of course, there's, there's, um, there are several studies that were done in academia, which we can use and look at uh, phase one and phase two studies as we, we talked about previously. And then at the same time, there are, you know, there's, there's generalized forums where you can get cannabis 101, you know, CBD mm -hmm. 101 that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, project CBD, for example, was a, a one I used early on. Uh, and I, there's a book out, a couple books out by some veterinarians that have written some, amazing synopses of just some subjective data that have come in on their end mm -hmm. that can give some guiding information. So, so again, this is one of these that you're, you're in, and I, I know for people at home who've been listening, you know, you're in the, the really the grayest of gray areas <laughs> there is when it comes to cannabis. I mean, yeah. I, I was, I thought that uh, it was a gray area for doctors to discuss it with human patients, but this is really as gray as gray can be. <laughs> And the frustration, I, I truly believe, is felt on both sides. When I say both sides, I mean pet parents as well as veterinarians. They, we, all, we really do. We, we know there's something there. And the pet parents, they want advisory and they want to be helped because that's what a veterinarian does in every aspect. You know, we create treatment plans and we help with, you know, tracking over time. And that responsibility is put in the pet parents' hand tremendously right now. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a scary time for everyone. But again, I'm, I'm truly optimistic that the gray zones will start to clear and that we will get some understanding over the next year or two of where veterinarians in global aspect can start to influence. But this will end up being the same situation that we have right now with humans, where a state, the state, the state, the state, mm -hmm. right? It looks like it for now. So you're going to have to be a state refugee to <laughs> figure out whether or not you can help your pet. <laughs> oh, you do, but you know, it's, uh, it is. It, it'll, it'll be a, a gradual, incremental graduation and uh, and i believe that evolution is coming but uh, it will be it will be a little slower than i think that some of us want but remain optimistic understand that there are people out there making some some really great strides and gains and and starting to collect data that will then with education advance the industry as a whole are we and right now you know again uh, in the last couple of years you know this industry has jumped on the cbd craze but then we've realized that we've neglected the fact that there's well over you know, 160 already identified cannabinoids, and right. there's possibly closer to 300 of them total. Right. Uh, it might even be more than that. Mm. Um, are we looking at this the same way when it comes to pets? I mean, again, some of the cannabinoids that work for humans mm. may be less as effective as the ones that work for pets. I know that, you know, uh, there has been research that says uh, already out there that, you know, sometimes animals seek out the cannabis plant in the wild. <laughs> when they have you know gastric issues or digestive issues or other issues that we don't even know what they are right. they seek out and eat the plant looking yeah. for a cannabis plant specifically uh, you know, that's so nature <laughs> must have been telling them something right it's a whole whole different topic that i think we could talk about forever but okay. yes cannabis has literally evolved for us with us for millions of years whether you're a human or you are another species so mm -hmm. you know the cannabis plant is amazing it's the entourage or ensemble effect is literally nature taking its course and 
making the most maximally effective with minimally antagonistic and or side effect profile that can be possible. And, you know, we hear humans where a full spectrum slash broad spectrum um, product is used where the side effects that maybe THC influences when it's by itself in an isolate and or in synthet synthetic form are minimalized to none. And so in animals, again, endocannabinoid systems are comparably almost the same. The phytocannabinoids we're using along with the other terpenoids and flavonoids and vanillinoids, all these other molecules exist in this, this amazing plant. Mm -hmm. They do, they, they work together synergistically and that's what we have to respect as we go on with this using a botanical based medicine. Absolutely. So, I mean, I guess if I wanted to bottom line it, I would say that, that people out there, especially pet parents out there who were really interested in providing their pets with what they think is an efficacious medication need to really kind of wait, not necessarily wait, but need to know that there's research being done mm -hmm. and the information is going to be coming their way. Right. And understand that, you know, the community in itself is just constrained right now by, you know, uh, law. Yep. Rules and regulations are preventing where we want to be and where we are right now. But at the same time, like you said, the, uh, the important thing to note is that um, the efficacy for cannabis is there and to look for safety is the same as in humans. So you want to make sure you're looking for a product that is a third party laboratory testing facility that's looking for pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, and then mycotoxins, you know, things of that nature, as well as then giving you a profile of the cannabinoids. The, the THC component in dogs were a little bit, you know, skeptical still right now because they're 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 responding differently. Dogs will get, for example, a lot more of an ataxic or a wobbliness. They'll also sometimes vomit, and they will also sometimes lose control of their urine, which are three almost opposites of what we see in humans. So there are differences we still have to find out. But I think for right now, the safety profiles that we look for in humans is the same you have to look for an animal or pet product. And in addition, also look for the safety of other chemicals that might not just the the toxins like you know the the heavy metals and things but mm -hmm. look for other you know uh, chemicals that are used in either you know making them a little bit more viscous or non-viscous right looking or, or even you know staying away from dietary treats in a sense right. you know because certain sugars and things right and that's the part that i'm that i'm very excited in 2020 to finally be able to be a primary source of help with is is essentially triaging the plethora of options out there and helping to find the safety profile so that the efficacy of cannabis itself can show the benefits of both humans and animal species gotcha well look you've been listening to doc zach pelosa Got it right now, right? Closer than the first time. Closer than the first time. <laughs> Zach, Zach was, and then, you, you know, it. we've been we've been yeah. trying to see if we can give you some information. Again, when it comes to you know navigating this space, and there's a space out here that's just booming right now. I mean, I think there's so many products in the marketplace that are claiming to be safe for your pets. And I'm gonna say, I think you, you got to really, really, really. Maybe, if they wanted to get some information from your consulting company, where would they go? How do they get it? Yep. So. LinkedIn has been an, an amazing uh, app for me in terms of connecting with some of the greats in the industry that are doing so the work that I, I really have to rely on right now. And so LinkedIn is easy to find me on there. Uh, I also have you know, two companies that I'm associated with. Uh, one of them would be uh, called Nature's Remedy, which is a one of the macrag cultivation and consulting companies. So, so that's what, so if they wanted to get information from that, where do you go? Macrag? What, how, what so would it be uh, Zach, Z-A-C. Okay. At uh, the nature remedy .com. At the nature remedy yeah. .com and yeah. the other company. And then my other comp my private consulting company is a, a private email that we can also share. That I'm really excited to to be able to to create a one on one relationship with people, which is why I'm finally sharing that with people. But basically, it's z a c dot p i l dot one seven zero six one nine at gmail .com, which is going to be again, it's not going to be straight, but it's going to be a, a more one on one consult beginning aspect that we're going to evolve to something that the whole world can benefit from. Oh, there you go. Well, you know, if you uh, like what you've heard today, make sure that you continue to tune in to Let's Be Blown with Martel. And you can go right down here in this corner right here and subscribe. And if you subscribe, we're going to make sure that you your name gets put in the mix for the possibility of being able to win a magic butter machine. But you got to make sure that you do a review because we need your review to actually help in the selection process. Make sure you tune in again to the next Let's Be Blunt with Montel.